Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar today, Taking Your Own Road. And uh, today is the 16th of June, 2020, at least I hope it's the 16th of June. Um, before we start, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you are welcome to ask questions or make comments through your chat feature at the bottom of your screen for people who are using uh, JAWS or text to speak. It's control H and it's H for Harry. We can't promise that we can answer all of your questions or refer to your comments, but we will do our very best. Also, this will be recorded. The webinar is recorded and you can also find it on our check-in and chat website and it's visionaustralia.org forward slash check in and chat. So today we are taking our own road and our guest today, our expert is singer, <laughs> songwriter and musician Robert Assini. Hi Robert and uh, welcome to Check In and Chat. Hi Stella, thank you so much for having me. I like the sound of being an expert. Expert, yeah, yeah, that's right. So we'll just uh, talk a little <laughs> bit about your biography. So um, you are a multi-award winning singer, songwriter and uh, it says in your bio that you infuse multiple genres and have a truly unique aura on stage. Does that yeah. ring true to you? Yeah, I think so. I try and live up to the to, to my bio. <laughs> but, yeah, obviously, um, yeah, I think that, that rings true. Um, it, you just got to go by what, um, what people, other people tell you when they come to see you play and I've heard stuff like that, so might as well put it in a bio and, and uh, yeah, for PR purposes and and make people want to come see me that haven't heard me, yeah. Now, we're going to go back to this point that we were just talking about, so we'll just give a little bit more of your bio. You're, a, you're based in Queensland yep. and you are now a full-time professional singer-songwriter or as full-time as a singer-songwriter and musician can be, especially yep. during COVID-19. Yeah. <laughs> yep. um, but you took a bit of a leap in 2010 uh, to uh, become a full-time singer, song writer. Now, yeah. before we talk about that, can you tell us a little bit about your vision loss? I can. Um, I, was, uh, I was born with uh, a rare eye condition called aniridia. And, um, yeah, so it's generally a genetic um, condition, but... Um, We've never been able to trace any sort of um, cases of it in my family. So I just sporadically got it. I was gifted with it, I guess. Um, so, yeah, and with Eneridia, if anyone else knows, you sort of, um, or Eneridia first off is with, uh, basically I don't have an iris. Um, so it's an absence or, or partial um, iris, um, which is a coloured part, circle part of your eye, which controls the amount of light coming into your eye. So my vision um, has always been very, very sensitive to light and glare uh, and it's been blurry and sort of hard to um, focus. My visual acuity is not very good, I, I guess. Yeah. Now we're going to leap into your music yeah. and uh, we'll probably touch on your vision loss and how you navigate that during okay. uh, when you do yeah. do gigs. So when did you start playing music and what prompted you to start playing music? Uh, well, I, I started, started singing when I was about seven or eight years old. I, um, uh, my, dad was, my dad was a musician um, in the 70s. He was a, a local musician in far north Queensland here. He was a bass player and his dad was a, a jazz musician. Um, and then, so my grandfather was a jazz musician and then his father, my great-grandfather was... A, um, a composer actually, also a performer and a composer. So he used to write music um, and he came from Malta. They migrated from Malta, which is um, the heritage of the Sini name. It's, it's, it's Maltese. Um, so, yeah, his family mi uh, migrated to Australia from Malta um, 
and yeah, the whole family, my, all my pops, siblings played jazz music. Um, and even my father's generation, his brother, um, and sisters were right into country music and played at country music festivals and, and stuff. So yeah, you could say I come from a, um, uh, a big sort of, it, it's in my blood, basically music. Yeah. So it's always been yeah. in my blood. So, um, but you're not a jazz, um, musician. So you must be a great disappointment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. Or country and western, or country music, I should say. No, so, but uh, I guess what, my, my music sort of infuses a little bit of, of especially country, I suppose. I'm not, don't, I don't consider myself to be a country musician, but um, it, it, there's definitely rootsy, rootsy stuff in my music, yeah. What is it? Well, I was going to ask. The question is, what what is it about music you love so much? But it sounds like also that it's just a part of who you are. Yeah, absolutely. It um, growing up, like I said, I was I started singing when I was about seven or eight, and my brother, my older brother at the time, was learning guitar, and so I, I was sort of accompanied by him, um, and that's how we got started. Really playing at um, family gatherings because obviously at our family gatherings guitars and instruments would come out and everyone would sit around playing music it was a, a big tradition in our family um, for a long time uh, of a Christmas night to to um, sit around and play music and sing and as a kid sort of watching that um, was probably inspiring and inspired uh, I sort of aspired to to be like my father or my pop to be able to play music, um, pretty pretty soon my brother and I were joining in um, and singing. I couldn't I couldn't sing without at first I couldn't sing without having a sheet of paper up in front of my face because I was that shy to sing um, at that stage. Uh, and so uh, by the time I was twelve, my brother was actually sort of jamming with another family friend of ours who was playing bass and they were sort of talking about forming a band and I wanted to be, I wanted to be the other guitarist in the band at first. So, but, and I got dad to show me a few things on the guitar, uh, but I didn't stick with it at that stage. Um, and at one of their jams at our friend's place, there was like an old Pearl drum kit. And I remember dad sitting me down and showing me how to hold my hands, um, not knowing anything about playing drums and, what I was doing probably wasn't the greatest thing, but it was, it sounded, it sounded okay at the time and enough for them to sort of like, Oh, that sounds not too bad. And so I, I basically taught myself really to play drums. So I used to play drums and sing. And so they start, we started a band and throughout my teenage years, I, I played in a covers band with my brother um, around North Queensland here. So that was, that was sort of the, the starting point of, of getting to know what music's all about and my apprenticeship, basically. Yeah. You hear that quite often from, uh, well, mainly guys in band, but people in bands where they often say, when we first started, we actually didn't know how to play our instruments and you mm. learn as you go along. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, uh, yeah. You go. Uh, I was just going to say that um, uh, like pretty much everyone in my family, we don't, we don't read music. We don't read music notation. So everything's sort of played by ear. So when my, my brother has always had a very good ear for music when he was playing guitar um, and he's quite a good singer as well. So yeah, it was, it was sort of always, always by ear playing music by ear, picking it up on the radio. If someone comes on the radio, being able to pick up a guitar and, and work out the chords and, and all that um, by ears was um, yeah a trait that's um, yeah, very well respected actually in music. So given you come from a quite a musical family, did you, I guess it wasn't so far out of the realm of possibility that you might make a career out of it, but did you imagine you'd make a career out of it? And at any point did you wonder, well, my low vision is actually going to stop me from doing this? I never thought that. Um, I never thought my low vision would stop me from doing it, especially at that time when I was a teenager. Um, I, I also was quite, 
uh, quite, I grew up playing soccer, so I was quite sporty going up. And I got to the point when I was about 13 um, where I had to sort of make a decision between sport and music because I was, um, I was, I was quite a good soccer player as well. But, um, but yeah, at that time, I sort of had to make the decision because I used to play soccer on Saturday afternoons and a lot, a lot of our gigs were on Saturday nights or Saturday afternoons if we had to play a wedding or something like that. Um, we had to set up or we had to travel away. It was just becoming too much, too much juggling. So I had to make the decision whether I was going to continue on playing soccer or taking up music and taking it more seriously and um, well, not more seriously, but just basically committing to just doing the band and, and stuff, which is what we were doing every weekend. So yeah, that, that's, that, that was, that was basically the point where I I'd sort of thought, um, yeah, it was it was good at the time because I was basically a semi-professional musician as well, I suppose, and going to school, being in high school, it was kind of cool. Um, just playing pubs and clubs on the weekend and having that experience. Yeah, um, can I, I can imagine if people said, what did you do on the weekend? And yeah. Like, well, well, well you're pop, it, you must have been popular. No, no, no I wasn't very <laughs> popular at all. I, I was, I wasn't unpopular, but I wasn't popular, popular, as you would probably say at school, but um, I was friends with everybody yeah. <laughs> and everyone seemed to like me. So that was, that was okay. Um, but yeah, I guess that was the starting point of whether I was sort of starting to think about making it a career. I, um, you know, I started writing, probably writing my own stuff at about 15. And then I actually, by the end of high school, I wanted to, when you have to make a decision on what subjects you study at school and all that and whether or not you want to go to uni. And I sort of thought uh, I'd really like to, I study audio engineering and sound engineering because I sort of developed through music, obviously developed a fascination with, with that sort of stuff. Um, and I, I made steps in high school to sort of study some certificate courses and things like that in sound engineering and that's what I sort of committed to do after, after school. But um, I was about, it was about um, a year, probably end of year 11 or start of year 12, I realised that to study what I wanted to study, I would have had to move to Sydney. So which for a small town boy from Innisfail um, in far north Queensland is a bit, bit of a scary notion. Uh, let alone, obviously, like you mentioned before, having, having a low vision moving to a big city where you know nobody um, was just, I just thought it would eat me up. So decided to instead um, go to uni in Townsville and study um, business management and uh, tourism. It's always good to have something uh, to fall back on. Did you finish, did you finish your university studies? Yes. Yeah. I studied for four years in, um, at, in Townsville. And you were yeah. still playing music during university? Yes, I was. I mean, the, the main, um, main thing about deciding to go to uni um, in towns, I was that, like you said, to get something behind me and that security, that security blanket underneath you, which is at the time I wasn't sure about. Um, and still looking back to this day, I'm sort of like, well, you sort of wonder whether what, what life would be like if I hadn't done that. Um, but I know that was something that my mum and dad wanted me to do was sort of get something behind me um, just in case. Um, and so mu uh, music sort of took a, a bit of a, um, a back step uh, during those years because I was so focused on um, and had to work so hard at uni, extra hard obviously than anybody else because, because of my vision. Um, felt like I had to, yeah, work really hard. So, um, spent a lot of time studying and, but I was playing music and starting to write, write, um, more and more songs and developing as a songwriter during those years. But yeah, I was, I was doing the odd, odd gig. And that was the first, first period I was doing solo gigs as well. So I, by that time I started playing guitar and, um, doing actual gigs solo rather than being in a band playing drums and singing. 
So it's interesting when you were talking about that you're at university and um, you you often wonder now what would have happened if you, you know, m- maybe not done that. And mm. I think one of the things that we're, when we're talking about something like music and the arts, that it is something that sort of, you know, you just do it when you feel inspired. But it actually takes a lot of time. And a lot of hard work. So, like, uh, with, you know, rehearsing that type of thing. So you could only really fit in either your university studies or your music, although mm. you did manage to fit some yeah. music in. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it helps for the first couple of years of uni being in a, in a little dorm room and um, having the encouragement of my neighbours when I was, whenever I was singing and playing guitar. Um, so that was encouraging at the time as well, knowing that, okay, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm pretty good at this. So I can't be, I can't be too bad. So yeah. Um, and obviously the feedback that I was getting from the gigs that I was doing at the time, um, was encouraging as well. Yeah. Now, for all our attendees out there, if we've got any musicians or would be, well, you're either a musician or you're not. Love to hear your comments and questions through our chat feature. So what was the stepping off point for you? I understand you were working full time when you decided to make the decision to pursue it professionally. So did you have a plan? Um, Well, sort of fast forwarding quite a bit um, to that point, but... um, But yeah, I, I I didn't really have a plan. The job by this stage, I I was I was obviously um, had moved to Brisbane, um, and this was after university, um, and it took quite a while for me to get established in Brisbane um, to find a place, a suitable place to for me to live. Um, I have relatives and friends in Brisbane that I stayed at for the first few months. Um, but had quite difficulty finding a job at first. It took me a good 12, 12 months or so, or even even longer to to find um, a job to sort of support me, um, to support myself. So, uh, yeah, so I, I was, it took a while to get established in Brisbane and then eventually I was able to do fine gigs and stuff around, around the place. And, so um, how did you do that? How does a musician country boy yeah. um get you know you arrive in brisbane how do you what do you do how to how to what are those initial steps well i, I same thing i did in townsville actually i used to i used to go around with a with a song list and a cd a demo cd which i'd recorded at home to venues um looking looking for gigs basically basically just hitting the pavement and, and going from door to door and any venues and whether, whether it was pubs or other places um, that were hiring live music, I would try and try and hit them up or get a foot in the door um, to, to play. Yeah. And that's what I did. That's what I did. Um, I, I did that in Brisbane, even when I had a day job, as you, as you would say in the music industry, um, so, and I had that day job for about two and a half years. Uh, so, yeah, I, I did that initially, but even even more so when I when I'd quit and, and um, become a full time musician um, or dedicated all my time to music, uh, I I um yeah pulled out all the stops then and also started writing. Um, I wanted to write um, a full length album and and improve my songwriting as well. So. Yeah, and I, and I ended up I ended up with playing three or four nights a week um, in Brisbane, which was quite quite okay with um, money wise, and it felt good to be um, a working musician, I guess, and playing that much. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they feel really good. Yeah. So, uh, so this was all before 2010. Now, at this point, had you entered any songwriting competitions or were they yet to come? Um, the, probably the first song competition I entered was um, towards the end of my uni or just after uni, which was a songwriting or song competition that a Brisbane-based producer was running. And 
he showed interest in uh, working with me. And so that was the first recording that I ever, the first Oh, right. Recording. So did you win that songwriting competition? I didn't win it, but I was on a, um, I, I, I suppose, a shortlisted. Uh, yeah, um, highly recommended. Sometimes yeah. not winning can actually be a good thing. So I'm quite involved in the writing community and I know people who haven't, who have had um, highly uh, recommended, they haven't won and, and better things. I mean, it's always great to win, but <laughs> it's not the be all and end all. No, absolutely. Um, yeah. So that it was, it was great. So he got in touch with me. It was sort of straight after I finished uni. So it was, it was ready. I was ready to sort of, okay, let's go chase this music thing. I've got something behind me now. Um, there's no stopping me now sort of thing. So, um, so I, I went down to Brisbane at that time and recorded um, an EP or three songs with him, which was, wasn't really released publicly, but it was more so a demo to sort of shop to record labels and industry people at the time. But that, that recording is actually available online and can be streamed and all that sort of stuff too. So that was basically my first cd or first recording um that i did and then yeah later on from, from actually from that cd from those few songs a number of um a number of things happened actually uh the music oz awards which is basically the unsigned arias one of the songs from that was a top five finalist so that was happening in sydney so i, I got to fight into sydney and and this is the awards. all this is all before you decided to go full time. Yeah, this is this oh, before right. I had, wow. um, you know, that job in Brisbane and yep. and all that. So, yeah, so I'd had a I had a bit of success in that before I had um, moved to Brisbane. And just actually, when I first moved to Brisbane, then I had the um, the Glen Shorrock Music Scholarship Award come up. And the same thing was a top five finalist. Now, and, for people yeah. listening who might not know who Glenn Shorrick is, yeah, I'm pretty sure most people do. So he is a – he was quite well known for being the front singer for the Little River Band and mm. he is a – is he a songwriter as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think he wrote, wrote most of the songs or was one of the major writers for the Little River Band, yeah. So you won the Music Scholarship Award. What did what did that involve? Well, I didn't I didn't win it, but I was a finalist. So oh, that's obviously right. yeah. it was it was handpicked out of thousands of of people, out of thousands of artists, and including bands, not just not just solo singer songwriters. Um, so there was about five finalists, and we all got flown down to Adelaide and to perform at this big wine festival in the Barossa Valley. Uh, so that was, we got treated like rock stars pretty much put up in a nice fancy hotel room and, and that. Um, so yeah. And obviously got to meet um, Glenn Shorrick and perform in front of him in, in front of this big, massive big crowd at this wine festival. So that was the final of, of, of those awards. Um, so I didn't end up winning, but um but yeah, that whole experience was obviously um, a very, very memorable. Um, also, playing the same same day was obviously Glenn Shark and the Little, and the Little River Band, but also um, people like James Rain and and stuff like that were playing the same same stage. So that was pretty cool. How important is it to put yourself out there? Like entering competitions, people might sort of think. Oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not going to win. Mm. Why would I do that? I might make a Twitter myself. But <laughs> did well, you have it? I'm not suggesting you had any of those thoughts. But yeah. So, oh. but you do, do you just take a risk and enter competitions? Um, I guess I, like, I can't remember if I sort of felt like that at all. I probably initially, I probably did. But uh, I'd. I don't think you have really much to lose if, if no one, I mean, with a lot of songwriting competitions, no one, it's not publicly out, the song's not publicly out there. It's just whoever's judging those, that, that competition. And sometimes it can just be a good, some, some of them have feedback as well. So sometimes they give you feedback. 
some competitions do. So they can actually, you know, say this was great, this was great, or maybe this could be stronger or this could be better. And how um, is it to get feedback and, con and constructive criticism? How important is it for an artist, a singer, songwriter, anyone to yeah. get feedback? And what is it like to receive negative feedback? Well, Especially for a musician, because with a writer, mm. negative feedback, you know, there's a reader somewhere which you'll never see, but with a yeah. singer-songwriter, it's pretty immediate, isn't it? Yeah, like it's, ma it's massive. It's massive to get feedback, and that's what, that's what helps you develop as even, a, even an artist or a, or a writer or in any part of the music industry, even if you're uh, into audio production and stuff, you're a producer, uh, people giving you feedback about your productions can help you, okay, well, okay, this wasn't right, so what, what do I need to do to fix that? Uh, so, I mean, it's that, that old saying that you don't, you know, there's always something else to learn and, and that you're never, never perfect, that's for sure. Do you have to develop a bit of a thick skin? Um, yeah, you have I to guess be you, sensitive at the same time, yeah, don't you? Yeah, you do. You have to, and especially when you get into the, into the stage where you are doing recording and working with producers because um, some of them or most of them will tell you, okay, um, you need to change this or this doesn't sound right, um, which was my, my first experience with a, working with a producer, that, that first CD that I just talked about, working with a producer in Brisbane who's sort of keen to work with me, but he wanted to sort of at the same time make sure that what was coming out was going to be good quality. So, uh, so he would, I was obviously the writer. So he would run, run ideas by me and say, okay, I think you need to change this line or I think you need to go away and write a bridge section for this song. Or, um, I don't think this sounds right. We need to do something different here. And you just sort of have to take it on board. You don't necessarily have to say, okay, that needs to happen then because he says so you just need to take it on board and, um, yeah, and, and think about it if you're comfortable with it or if you're not. And then there's been times where I've, I've thought, no, I'm going to stick to my guns and that's the way it is. So, yeah, that's, you, you've got to have a thick skin, but you've also got to be open to ideas. Yeah. Now, we've got uh, one of our attendees has asked a question. Benjamin, mm -hmm. uh, right. he also said he's walked a similar path but couldn't okay. quite go full-time and then a job yeah. took over. But he is asking, how do you go about remembering lyrics <laughs> when you're vision impaired? That's a very, very good question. I get that question so many times. Um, everyone, yeah, it, it's with much difficulty. Uh, and there's only one word answer really is repetition uh, is just to play the song over and over, sing the song over and over or listen to it over and over the actual recording. So if you're listening to a, an Ed Sheeran song or something like that, and you want to be able to remember all the lyrics, then just listen to it. And like anybody, so if, if you, if you like a particular song or you hear it lots on the radio, you eventually end up knowing all the lyrics to it. So it's just a, <laughs> yeah, it's just you just yeah, yeah. So yeah, uh, that's yeah. how I remember lyrics and also chords as well, because um, I obviously can't have a have a um, music stand in front of me to be able to read. So, which it, you know is 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 a is a disadvantage. Um, to be honest, um, I have a partner that 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 she can have a, a music stand in front of her with the lyrics and chords. Um, Cause she's a singer songwriter as well. And yeah. And she can, and she can just sort of be able to do that on a moment's notice and look up a song on an iPad or something, but I can't do that. I have to be able to learn the song beforehand and be able to remember it to play it. So it is a disadvantage, but in, in the long way around, it's actually a good thing to have because not only is it keeping your memory in your brain sort of active and going, um, which is a very good thing, but it's, it's also just, I don't know. I think it impresses people because people think, how do you remember all this sort of stuff? Or how do you remember to play these songs? And you might not 
you might make mistakes. You definitely make mistakes. I make mistakes all the time and forget lyrics and chords. I forget lyrics. Do you just songs. kind of just throw a bunch of other lyrics into a song if you go, oh, I can't remember the lyrics Absolutely. now? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you mumble or you, or you I'm, I'm apparently, I've been told I'm very good at this. I'm apparently, when I forget lyrics, even to my own songs, I'm very good at covering them up so no one notices. So, you, yeah. You, Point yeah, to I, people in the audience, your turn. Yeah, maybe. absolutely. It's time, <laughs> time for a sing-along. <laughs> so, um, Talitha says it definitely impresses his partner that he can learn uh, things up by heart. Talith is actually my partner. <laughs> yeah, I thought that so might be the case. <laughs> she's having a sneak, she's sending in a sneaky question. <laughs> she said it's your turn to do the dishes as well. Oh, okay. No, she didn't say that. I made that up. So, um, and Benjamin has said that he does that too as well. Yeah. Um, so Courtney has asked, how do you learn how to play a song like initially like initially do you listen to it by the radio and figure it out by ear i can do that um and maybe that's the first maybe that's the first point if i hear a song on the radio or or something or on the tv i might or on a cd i think oh, i might want to learn that and i'll pick up the guitar and just figure out maybe the basic chords or what key it starts in at, at the very least uh, but if i'm really lazy or um, just want to get get to know the song really quickly. I'll look up the chords online. So there's um, there's a lot of different different sites you can go to to get chords um, to songs um, and lyrics. But one that I've found good uh, is called Ultimate Guitar, which is an it, it can come in an app as well on your iPad and all that sort of stuff as well. And it's I think you can enlarge enlarge the font of it to a certain extent as well so you can make the font um, big in the in the actual wherever you're looking at it from whether it's a web page or in the app you can download download pdfs of the chords as well of a particular song um, and the yeah, ultimate guitar is pretty much the major one to go to so you can you can pretty much find probably any song you'd want to learn on there they're not always correct, I'll say, uh, because it's it's made up of people basically um, making these tabs up, what they call tabs, so tablature or chords, so people figuring out the chords and then posting them onto this onto this site. Um, but they're they're reasonably accurate most of the time. Um, but yeah, it it definitely helps to get up and running pretty quickly if you're wanting to learn a, a song. That's fantastic. Do you have any other apps or websites you might recommend to people who are blind or have low vision? I'm not really, I don't really have a lot. I'm actually doing, been doing some research the past couple of days into, into some stuff because I'm, that's something that I'd really like to research more myself uh, to see how what's out there. And that's maybe very, maybe more accessible for people like myself Um that have low vision or uh, or totally blind. So, um, yeah, I've I doing a quick search in the past day or two. There's there's if you are into saying recording like computer like audio recording. Apparently, there's a um, well, there's a program called Cakewalk, which is an audio production um, software program for your computer. Uh, that, that's apparently very very um, accessible for people with low vision um, and you can What's use that? cake walk cake walk. Yeah. Oh. I haven't, I don't know a lot about it myself, um, yeah. but anyone that is keen or is into doing audio, audio production um, that might be something to check out. It's apparently um, I think it's, I think you can use jaws with it. Um, I've read. So yeah. So I've just read that it's very accessible and they've made it very accessible to people with low vision. Um, but yeah, that, that is an area that I'm actually researching, starting to research myself. So I'm, I'm not a great source on all things, um, any sort of apps or, or things that might be, uh, great for people with low vision. I'm sort of like anybody else. So I use magnifiers or, or, um, screen, um, screen magnifiers on a computer to read stuff. So I sort of make do, but I probably would like to do some more research and find out what's out there. 
We've only got a, about another 10 minutes to go and we've got some questions and some comments. Uh, Jamal says that Repo is also great for NVDA and voiceover users. And somebody yeah. has said Reaper is good and there is a course. Oh, wow. So I'm, uh, I'm learning yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's great. And um, uh, how many songs do you reckon you've got? in your head by memory oh probably got a couple of hundred all right <laughs> uh, but and yeah. now here's here's a question i actually have completely forgot to ask who are your influences my influences that's a good good question um i've probably my main influence has been in the artist that i've been mainly into is john mayer um and his music um sort of going up in um in that in that sort of university years of of trying to find my own way, try my find my own type of music. That was sort of very much the stuff I was listening to. So yeah. Um John Mayer. I listen to a lot of people that probably people never heard of, a lot of American singer songwriters that I've just sort of stumbled upon that aren't huge. Uh but you know, I like people like Ed Sheeran and and that too that are maybe more well known. Um who else? Who else? But yeah, even I grew up. I grew up on seventies rock, basically classic rock, with my old my dad's old record collection. So I grew up on things like and playing in the band. We used to play like Credence, Credence Clearwater Revival, and the Eagles, and um, you know all that sort of stuff. So I grew up on all that classic rock stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And. Um... Uh, now Mufard has asked Mufid has asked that you play a song. Unfortunately, uh, we did you did yes. we did try and organise to, to play to you to play some songs, but mm -hmm. Zoom is not no. the audio for that. Unfortunately, yeah, we tried doing a test with Zoom and it was atrocious. Unfortunately, for audio. So what I had in mind to do for anyone that is interested. And I was going to go live straight after this webinar on my Facebook page, which is where I've been doing weekly um, live streams from. Um, and I've been doing a live stream every Friday night called Rob's Recharge in the Garage. So, What's it called? Rob's Recharge, recharge in, the, in the Garage. In the Garage. So I've got my garage set up as uh, basically a, a studio, I guess, as far as a streaming studio. Uh, and, yeah, my partner and I have been doing our solo streams and we also do a duo stream on a Saturday night. Um, but yeah, I've, I've been doing that um, ever since all this craziness started and we've had to cancel all our gigs and I had to postpone doing a tour. I was going to do a tour this year as well, touring my new album. So yeah, unfortunately that's, that's been the place in the past few months that we've been getting all our music out. Yeah, artists yeah. and musicians are really doing it tough mm. like your with your livelihood. Yeah. Um so we'll get your details on how people can find you and listen to you and how they can uh, you've got an album out as well. Yeah. yeah. So how I just just released an all, an album in September last year. So that was, which is my debut album, debut full length album. So that's available at robertsini.com. Um it's also available um, anywhere you're streaming on Spotify or Apple, but I'll, I'll say if you can follow me on those streaming services, cause they don't really pay artists very much. Um, but otherwise, if you want a CD, I can get on robertsini.com and order it and I'll sign it and send it out to you. That's, Fantastic. Um, the best way. Or you can download the songs from robertsini.com directly. So how do you develop your stagecraft as someone who has a low vision? So stagecraft is, I guess, about connecting with the audience and. Yeah. It's, um, it's obviously, it's not as big a challenge as you would think really, because in some ways it could be an advantage because in certain situations where you might be nervous and someone that's fully sighted, can see everything that's going on around them and maybe see the looks on people's faces or see people, how many people is in, in that place. When you have low vision, um, you can't see people's faces. And so maybe that's a little bit of an advantage in a way because um, you, you maybe, maybe, maybe just dials down the nerves, the nerves a bit and makes you feel like not so many people are watching you um, in the same token. It can be a disadvantage because 
in when you're playing at a venue, um, you maybe not be able to read, be able to read the crowd visually. So um, I read the crowd basically on the applause I'm getting um, and things like that. And I can work out, okay, people are loving what I'm doing. So I'm doing okay. So, so I sort of, I rely obviously on, on that sort of feedback. And um, here we go. What are your top tips for someone who is blind or has low vision who wants to get into music? And are the, yep. So there you go. Top tips. Okay. Um, I would just, I would just say, well, one thing I want to point out is that I, and one thing I've tried to do is, is not be, um, I never wanted to be a, a, I want to be the musician who is vision impaired, not the vision impaired person who's a musician. You know what I mean? So if you are aspiring to play music, if there's a particular instrument that, that takes your fancy um, or you've had a start on, then give it a good go. And um, like I play guitar and I, I, um, I have to put stickers on my, on the neck of my, on, on the neck of my guitar these days to see where I am or work out where I am. So any sort of little things like that, that might help you if you play guitar and you have low vision or you're, yeah. So um, I would say just get started and, and music is such, uh, that's what I, what I love about music so much. It's such a, an unspoken and universal language that anyone can do it. Uh, so, and it's, I think it's a particularly good avenue for people that have low vision because music is about hearing things and um, yeah. And, and so I would embrace that actually. Yeah. That's fantastic. Now um, for me, so uh, I've there, I went up to Brisbane, so I'm down in Melbourne. I see Brisbane. There's something really interesting happening in Queensland and Brisbane in terms of music, to me, it is, it's, it's such a place where it's really interesting of how many musicians come out of Brisbane and Queensland. Yeah. And especially um, people who are blind or have low vision. I met a blind DJ up there. I've met uh, lots of blind, okay. low vision singers as well. Do you bump into any of these musicians? Do you know any of other, any other low, blind or low vision musicians in your travels? Um, I, I do know of one in Brisbane when I was in, living in Brisbane. Um, I met uh, a young fellow, I can't remember the name of his, 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 his name off the top of my head, sorry, but I, I did meet someone in Brisbane who's a, a, a piano player. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know anyone up here, I don't think, in North Queensland that I've met anyway. Yeah. I'm sure there's, there's, there's people around, but yeah, no, I've... I, uh, I had, I'd sell one of the previous Vision Australia webinars, um, whether it was, is it Donna? Who was a yeah, songwriter? Donna Dyson. Yes, She's a yes. Queenslander. I did, yeah. look, there's something about Queensland and mm. music. So I met Donna and uh, I met her at the ASA Awards last year in October. We both won ASA Awards. So that's how I met her. So awards. what's ASA, Australian Songwriting Awards? Yeah, and Australian David Songwriting Trung. Awards. Is it David Trung? David who's Trung. The, yeah. It is David, yes. Thanks, Benjamin. Yeah. Thanks, Benjamin. Yes, that, it is David. So I, I've met and know David when I was in Brisbane. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah something really interesting happening now. Um, we are just about uh, the toward the end. We've got... Um, we've gone through all the questions. Oh, here we go. Do you too often, well, not at the moment, no. or do you find <laughs> Brisbane has enough of a live music scene or Queensland to keep you busy? And do uh, you want to tour? I, well, I definitely want to tour, um, especially after making an album. But um, And yeah. it's, it's sort of the next big thing uh, to tick off for me because I've never toured before. So... Um, uh, yeah, that's that's something for me. But as far as Brisbane goes, I mean, I haven't been there for uh, a good four years or so now. So I've I've obviously moved up to North Queens, back up to North Queensland because I had some other health issues, and so I found myself back up here. Uh, but um, I, I guess definitely at the time there was there was 
plenty going on and there was quite a quite a buzz uh, about what what was going on in Queensland or in Brisbane um, so yeah I, I would say so um, like anywhere I mean even Cairns where where I sort of play around there's there's quite a good healthy little music industry so yeah, yeah. just the tourism help uh, in some stages I think I guess because there's there's you know plenty of hotels and stuff to yeah. play around and and that but yeah at the moment it's obviously yeah suffering a lot but yeah well we wish you all the best and hopefully this will be over quite soon but if you would like <laughs> to support a musician the best way you can support a musician is to buy their album so yeah. uh, would you like <laughs> to give us your website and where people can follow you again robert Yes, um, my website is all the w's dot robertcini dot com, uh, which obviously my my surname is spelled C I N I. Um, for those that are wondering, because sometimes that can be a bit tricky. Uh, or uh, Facebook is obviously a good way um to get in contact with me or follow me. Uh, my Facebook page is facebook dot com forward slash robertcini music. And I'm on Instagram and all that sort of jazz as well. So, so yeah, um, I'm on all the social media and stuff. Yeah, you, you should be able to find me. But they're the, they're the main two. Facebook and my website are the main things. Yeah. I feel like I need to read uh, this last comment out from Janelle Colcorn. I do apologise if I've mispronounced your surname, Janelle. Um, I've actually interviewed you on Talking Vision and she says, we have heaps of blind and vision impaired musos in Brisbane okay. and uh, uh, myself being one, which is why I began Salubrious Productions, an entertainment and production agency specialising in artists with disability. Wow. So you might have a lot of people coming up to your gigs in Cairns at some point, Robert. Yeah, hopefully. That <laughs> yeah. that that sounds great. Yeah, that, that sounds a great like a great um contact and great resource. Yeah. And Jamal says, This was great. Thank you guys. And you are more than welcome. And there will be a recording of this webinar on Vision Australia's check in and chat. And I think we've got a couple more check in and chats to go uh, in the month of June and then we are finishing up in early July. Congratulations and thank you so much for your time, Robert. Thank you, Stella. I'll just say that I'm about to go live on Facebook. So for anyone that wants to go over and, and check out a few songs, um, that's where you can find me. Oh, and Rosemary says, thank you. Signed into Facebook, ready to listen to Facebook Live. So, Robert, you better okay. rush off and uh, get yourself prepped. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Robert. And Thanks. thank you, everyone, for your comments and questions. Thanks, everybody.